customers, they're like, wow, I did not know that you guys had all of this. We have Cartesian systems, we have uh, servo press and so on and so on. Alejandro, you can also bring some additional things that I'm missing probably. Yeah, definitely. Um, Festo has a few divisions. As a global company, uh, you can start from a, a pretty large umbrella where you have hardware, software, uh, bionics, learning channels, didactic, and so on. And every division will start diverting on, on his own. So if you take automation, for example, the automation part is huge, as Sandra was mentioning. Festo Didactic is also huge because we are present in multiple countries and multiple universities and colleges with uh, didactic modules that are more or less like probably 80% of you know, or 90% of Festo components, all developed by Festo Didactic. We also have another division, which is Bionic and so on. So as a company, we have a few areas to work with. The good thing about it is where I'm working on is Festo Customer Solutions. And mm -hmm. that is the unique team globally present that takes all that and put it all together for particular opportunities or for, or for particular customers. So you can imagine as a sales company, you are forced to sell product. You have to sell whatever you produce and that's it. In Festo, the, the, the role is a slightly different. Uh, we sell what we produce, but we also combine what we produce with other vendors. And that's unique. And the reason why we do that, as I mentioned before, is we are um, um, customer satisfaction specific or customer satisfaction driven, uh, where we want to make sure that the customer can get the best in the market from the best vendors. In that case, we produce and provide whatever we can provide as much as we can from the Festo portfolio, but also we combine multiple other vendors to complete the whole package. And that's part of the Festo customer solutions team. And the reason why we do it that way is because as I mentioned, we have a large, large portfolio where we can pretty much build a complete system out of just Festo components from a very basic feeding up to a control system, screens, motion, like tubing, you name it. So more or less, that's what it is. And I think that's a you know very good approach without obviously wanting to name any other suppliers. I think it's interesting that you can support and provide you know the technical expertise on their platforms as well. Again, because I think that in the manufacturing setting, whether you want it or not, you're always going to have different platforms. Exactly. You're going to have, again, different interfaces. You're going to have certain parties that do things better or worse you know so obviously the customer will have their preference there's obviously like financial reason reasons but there's also um you know the inability for engineers let's say at the, a certain level to dictate what parts they want to uh, have in a certain project so it's really good to have like a one source stop um in a sense and be able to get support from festo and i've like i said i've experienced this myself in the past and i I know that uh, like the engineers are ready to help you out on integration with uh, with different platforms, which yeah, I think is really cool. Exactly. So so Festo Customer Solution is is a, a unique team. Actually, we have mechanical engineers, we have controls engineers, electrical engineers, uh, production people. I, imagine it's like a, a mini company inside a company where we drive some particular technology. So the beauty of that is we can one day be working in. Um, automotive plant. The next day, we're going to be working in extraction uh, machine for cannabis. Uh, the next day, we're going to be working in process automation. The next day, we're going to be working with a, a company that produces cinema systems for simulation. So we cover a lot of the type of technologies. And that's what I like about my job. Particularly speaking, in my job is really exciting because I can learn multiple things in order to satisfy customer needs and that's why the customer solutions department is is made of yeah. how do you keep up to date i guess like a, a little side mm -hmm. question because there's so many new things like always coming up not just you know from festo but all these other vendors that you work for is there like oh, it, i don't know do you have a, a strategy do you guys have documentation on everything like how do you yeah like do you go to trainings uh, on a regular basis like um, what does that look like? it depends it depends it depends it's based on on person right uh some guys prefer just to stay with uh, the basic information that they can find and, and, and stay there. They kind of find the sweet spot. 
Others, we prefer to go a little bit beyond. We find out you know, information, we contact vendors, uh, we talk to them, they give us training and we, we kind of learn on our own time. It's very challenging, I can tell you, because I have three kids. I came to Canada with one and I have now three. Uh, one of each in each province. So my, my older one is a Colombian guy. My second baby is from Montreal. So it's a French speaking. Mm -hmm. And my third one is my daughter, which is an, an, from Ontario. So it's very, it's very challenging because you have to keep up, you know, at home, uh, work with your family, but also at the same time, you have to be up to date. Uh, and being up to date today is really challenging because you have a lot of information coming. Like you don't know sometimes if you are in the right path or not. And, but, you know, it's part of our, our, our strategy. I guess everyone can build up their own <laughs> strategy. I mean, I, sometimes I'm connected like at 1 a.m. and Sandro is there. <laughs> and I'm just chatting with him about multiple things. And sometimes I'm just off and he's on and so on. So, yeah, it's, it's very challenging, especially yeah. because we have a lot of information, like from any multiple vendors, uh, the company itself. We have a database, huge database with components and so on. So the other the other thing thing is that nowadays there's really no excuse on on saying oh i don't have access to that particular information or something well maybe something very specific but like like solis plc for example like you guys have and i don't want to throw in like a commercial there but this is a really good example youtube is really a fantastic platform like uh, like last year during covid and everything i was like you know what i finally want to sit down and learn python you know what I did? I, I just sat down and went through several different YouTube channels and I learned Python. And now I, I have several projects running on Python. So there's really no excuse. We have, for example, Festo, we're creating content that so you can learn how to program a servo drive and so on. But so so are so the, 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 some other companies are doing the same thing. And I'm not saying like, no, 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 Festo should be the only one doing this. No, I want to see everyone creating content for the future generations because that is going to stay there. You know, maybe a year from now, you have a, a recent graduate coming out of college and he doesn't know how to wire a compact logic, for example, or a Festo PLC. So now you have these videos and it's showing you the 24 volts goes here because of this and this and this. So there are a lot of sources out there. It's just a matter of actually prioritizing because you have so many things that you can learn. Right. So now you have to pick. No, absolutely. Yeah. I, you know, I completely agree with that. I think, you know, the one maybe. Uh, difficult or challenging part in hardware, right? It's it's always the cost. Like I would love to learn how to program robotics. You know, the one that you have sitting behind you, Alejandro. The challenge is that it's extremely expensive sometimes, and you want to get that hands-on experience. But I think like with new tools, there's gonna be like simulations. I know there's companies coming up with, um, you know, different ways to simulate robotics. So I think that's gonna be really cool. And for the most part, I think you do have simulators for PLC systems. So. As you said, there's really like no excuse, but it's interesting how like, you know, the hardware world is coming into <clears> software and making it like more and more easier because I think companies realize that the more, uh, or I guess like the ent the easier the adoption rate or the entry point, the more people are gonna get, the more experts they're gonna right. get, uh, the more people are going to be, I would say like excited about the technology, you know, because ultimately you still want people to, um, come into this field and say like, yeah, this is what I want to do over, you know, picking, let's say like Google, Facebook, whatever, like, because I, yeah. I think like manufacturing has a lot of like really interesting challenges that are still, um, like oh, underrated yeah. by engineers in general. Yeah. Right. It's, it's very exciting what's happening right now. And you mentioned, uh, Vlad very, very easily. And is um, the trends now are moving towards simulation. And it's been there for almost maybe eight years. I remember when I went to Hanover the very, very first time in Germany, I saw a lot of simulation processes happening in the fair and so on. And we were here in North America thinking, oh, when is that coming? And it came like five years after. So simulation processes and, and emulation is coming up very quickly now with all the technologies. And you mentioned about this robot back there. <laughs> We actually can we can actually simulate everything. You don't need that robot in order to learn, and that's the beauty of the technology right now. You can actually learn everything from Festo software, 
uh, everything from other vendors and you don't have to have the hardware and that's the beauty, but you have to try to find out the right person to talk to. You have to find out the video that teach you that in YouTube and the right person to talk to when you have issues. But yeah, everything is getting now up to the point that you can pretty much simulate everything up to the point that you can simulate the whole machine in a, in a virtual environment and at some point merge that code into a real, and it should be prob probably 80% or 90% done. That's yeah. what's happening right now. There's, there's, however, there's no substitution for stress, right? Like being in an automotive plant and, you know, supervisors screaming at you because something is stopped or something, that, that you still have to go out there and do it. And that's it's usually what I recommend every, everyone on college, like taking a college degree on in some sort of engineering or anything, go out and get an, an internship or something that you can do at at least a year before you graduate. I, I did it I, I did it two years before I graduated and that was a huge, that made a huge difference. So I definitely recommend doing that. Um, then the other thing about simulation is, yes, that is possible and I've done it in the past. I've, I've worked on a, on a little system where I programmed everything before I actually hard, had the hardware. I programmed everything, the whole sequence. And then once the mechanical engineers finished assembling the hardware, I just went, in down, went down there, downloaded my code. Of course, I had to do some debugging, but everything worked and I saved a lot of time by doing that, right? Yeah, and that's yeah. what you would do in the real world scenario regardless, right? Because uh, uh, to some extent, you do want to simulate your software, or at least run it on a PLC before you get to the site to minimize, I guess, the time spent in the in the real environment, right? Like that, I don't right. think... Uh, I don't think the simulations are purely designed for learning purposes. They are designed to simulate a real environment to see how, again, like the robot, you can pre-program it for a specific application based on customer specifications so that once the simulation is complete, you can reliably put it in the field, obviously fine tune and uh, make sure that everything's good. But that's the, uh, that's the reality of how the, um, the projects are executed in the real world. Yeah. One thing I wanted to mention now that we're touching uh, on, on those topics is um, I remember when I came to Canada and I started at Festo uh, back, uh, back in Montreal, uh, I was really, really good on some particular topics at Festo and I was able to take any challenge. But when I got that call that I have to travel two, two, two hours to go and visit a customer and I have to fix a problem, as Sandra mentioned, at 5 p.m., and I have to stay overnight because the shift next day, they need to start with the system. That's the challenge that you need to get. And you need to feel that flavor. You need to feel yeah. that kind of challenges. Otherwise, sitting in your computer and learning is nice. But when you get those challenges, it's kind of very nice and unique. Now, I remember back then, and it was interesting because that's how you learn things that you don't want to learn. If you don't <laughs> want to learn something, the life <laughs> will push you to learn that. Yes. So, so yeah. also the other thing is, as Sandra mentioned, when you're trying to learn something, sometimes you really have to just sit down and do it. Otherwise, uh, if you always, you know, push, 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 you, you will never get it. Yeah, we all, we all have a story of blowing up a drive or blowing up a, a, an input card exactly. or something, right? That's when you learn and you never forget those, those, experiences. those experiences. I can tell you I never forget those experiences. <laughs> yeah, that's very expensive mistakes in certain cases, right? That's, right. Exactly. It does happen. Um, yeah. I want to discuss really quickly, I guess, non-technical uh, background. So, Sandro, you have a very... Uh, interesting background in aviation. So I want to like <laughs> cite touch on that because I think it's a it's an interesting topic. You know, we don't always discuss like what uh, other hobbies uh, people usually have outside of controls. But um, I think it would be really cool if you can give us a rundown of, um, you know, what it takes to get the license that you've uh, acquired. And, um, you know, maybe uh, some interesting an interesting story of the process it would be really cool. Yeah, sure. So, um, yeah, as you mentioned, I, I did get my uh, my private license, uh, private um, pilot license uh, with the FAA here in the U.S. I did that. Uh, I don't know, probably if eight or ten years ago. Um, and I initially did it because my dad, uh, he, he's also a private pilot and he, you know, we were looking for things to do together. Uh, so that was one thing. And the journey overall, I mean, I would recommend it to everyone, everyone that likes aviation in general. Uh, you get to learn a lot of different things, uh, a lot of different 
methodologies too that I can also translate into my into my work. For example, the use of checklists, right? Like whenever you're at work and you wanna, you know, you wanna and have a procedure, you, overall, you follow I mean, a checklist so you don't forget about anything. Same thing with doing aviation. You have, you know, okay, did I close the door? Did I shut the window? Did I do this, that, that, and so on. Um, in terms of the process to get it, uh, it's as simple as just going to any flight school. So if you Google a flight school nearby your place, you might find one and uh, you can just, you know, make an appointment. And usually I think maybe a lot of the flight schools, what they do is on your very first day, they will take you out for a ride on the, on the plane, right? So you can actually feel it and see if you like it. Um, and I can tell you that I would say probably a, lar a large percentage of people do like it and they want to go back. Uh, and then after that, you have several other sessions where you go and practice and, you know, you start turning and all of this with an instructor. Of course, you're not doing this by yourself. Uh, and then there's different things, that, different milestones that you have to accomplish. For example, you have to do a a cross-country flight with your instructor. So now he will show you how to navigate, which kind of instruments to use and so on. The other milestone is doing your first solo flight. So that one is also an interesting one. The very first solo flight, you actually, you're, you're just around the, your home airport and you're just flying around there doing, doing some touch and, uh, touch and goes, how they call it, so land and take off again. And then the, the milestone that I remember the most is doing the, the cross-country the cross solo. That one is interesting because you're flying to multiple different airports, nearby airports, uh, but you're doing it by yourself, still do, still being a, a student. So it's quite uh, nerve wracking. Um, but again, you prepare for this. So you have the knowledge. It's just a matter of executing. Then after this, you take some uh, some written tests and some oral tests as well. And uh, uh, you, you finally get your license. So it's it takes some time it also takes some money <laughs> but it's definitely worth it oh it's a really cool um um i guess hobby and something you know that i would aspire one day to uh to get i think it's a it's an interesting way i don't know if it's uh extremely good for practicality purposes but uh i think you know when we spoke uh in the past you mentioned that some people do use those um, those licenses to fly to customer sites so that too is a is an interesting uh, aspect yeah yeah i do know a, a few machine builders that you know they have their own plane and whenever they have to go out and visit another co a customer far away they just take the plane and go there's yeah. also there's also a guy that I, I i follow on linkedin i'm connected with him i think his name is, is shay myers I, I believe and he's in agriculture so he also has his plane and goes down to california and so it, it's pretty cool man uh, if i could maybe in the future i would buy my plane and also fly in the weekends <laughs> Yeah, no, absolutely. Dave, what do you, uh, what do you think? Uh, that's a pretty yeah. big journey. No, absolutely. So I have uh, had a couple of customers based out of Chicago um, and their whole thing was that they were a family of pilots, but pilots doesn't pay nearly as much as manufacturing. And so they, they owned a couple uh, of aircraft and every time they had to go somewhere, they would just pull the jet out and they would go fly the, uh, fly the jet. I, I think it's one of those. It's a it's a want. It's a love. They love flying. They, they want the uh, that, that ability. I I'm not sure that any of us, uh, or at least Vlad and I, will will get to the point of it makes financial sense to own you know a, a twenty million dollar aircraft and put it in the hangar and uh, and pay a hundred thousand dollars a year for the uh, the pilot to be on call to fly us. But I think it's something that we should all aspire to at uh, at some point in time. Yeah. Exactly. You can always dream it, right? You, you can you always dream there, it. Whether you end Abs up there is a different story, but you can always dream it. Right. Very nice. Absolutely. Absolutely. No, no, I, I appreciate it. So um, uh, a normal question uh, that we ask everyone um, is if they have a, a book or, you know, some other content that uh, that they would suggest uh, mm -hmm. other pe other listeners reading. I like to joke, this is the point where, uh, where Vlad's taking out his notepad and uh, and finding a way to spend his monthly audible credit <laughs> um so i actually was prepared for this because i have seen some of your previous sessions and i actually usually try to see them or watch them um there are a few books uh, i would i i'm just gonna start with this one because it, it's it's probably gonna be surprising for engineers uh listening into this to this session today and it's this one 
So I don't know if you can see it. If you can see it there, uh, this is from uh, the Harvard Business Review on emotional intelligence. And the reason why this might be interesting for engineers is because a lot of the times we forget that we're humans, right? Like when we go into college and we take all of these courses, and you know we're involved in programming. At one point, we really start thinking in binary, <laughs> right? Like you're like. Uh, I, a lot of the times I've seen engineers struggling, for example, to make connections, like to, to be able to interact with other human beings. We become too, uh, I guess, too machine oriented, maybe, right? Cool. So it's very important to, to learn this topic. This is really a topic that I try to learn as much as I can. There are several books out there. Uh, there's also another book, this is in Spanish, but you will also find it. Uh, this is translated from English from mm -hmm. Daniel Goldman. And, uh, it's kind of like the same topic. Um, it really helps, you know, to develop those soft skills. And the reason why I say it's important to develop this is because remember that we are not only one individual working at a, at a facility or a company. We always have to work in teams. We always have to deal with other personalities. So it's always important to understand how is this person going to react if I say this, right? How how did I interpret what that person told me and so on? So there, this topic is so wide, but I think it's definitely something to to look into. And then lastly, oh, I dropped it. But lastly, this is another good one that I liked. Going back to manufacturing, this is uh, an autobiography by Lee Iacocca. Uh, so this was the guy that uh, was working at Ford and then later on go to Chrysler. I really like that book because it goes and talks about all of the challenges that he experienced there, all of the different behaviors that he saw there at these, uh, these big companies, of course. So it gives you a, an insight into those kind of situations. No, I, I really like those points. Like, and, and again, I think this goes back to Alejandro's point that he has made, right? When you're a controls engineer, I feel it's very different from a desk job, right? Like you may, may get that impression again sometimes when you're not in the field, but the reality is, even if you work at a manufacturing plant, you do have to go out and talk to your operators. You have to talk to your mechanics and all that plays into being able to connect with people and being able to, um, I wouldn't say like just get information, but it's understanding the problem. It's being able to communicate back and forth. It's being able to, once again, to communicate with people of different backgrounds. It could be, again, different languages, different areas. So all of that plays a very important role. And I really like those books, Sandro. Really appreciate it. Very nice. One one point that I wanted to mention in that regards is, uh, and that's unique actually in our own team here in, in, in customer solutions, is sometimes we have to be very technical. Sometimes we have to go and find out those soft skills and address situations where we have to talk to a customer. Uh, we have to, you know, address particular points. Um, you know, sometimes the customer is saying, no, 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 I want this, I want this. And you're saying, no, no, this is not the right approach. And you have to manage those conversations. And at the end of the day, you're not probably talking about technical details, but you're talking more about application specific. And then, then you have to address those points that Sandra was mentioning. Okay, how you manage situations with different customers. Some customer will say, you know what, I'm fine with that. Whatever you said is fine. Some others will be very reactive and say, no, you know what, I want, I don't want this. I want this. So, and that's where we have to kind of find out the right spot to address situations like that. Do you have any uh, books, Russ Alejandro? Any thoughts uh, that you may add? <laughs> Well, um, I'm, I don't read a lot of books. What I try to do actually is actually uh, I watch a lot of YouTube videos about things that I like to do. Um, back when I back home when I was younger, I used to play a lot of ping pong, and at that time I was really good. Not anymore. Um, and, and I like, for example, to watch you know videos about ping pong and so on. I also like a lot about, as I mentioned, technology. So I really like to see, um, watch videos in YouTube where you see different technologies combine uh, machine builders, how they do, how they produce their machines. I really like that. And that's where I got kind of get some learning, some experience, uh, especially because I'm very technical. I, I don't spend too much time like sitting and, and, and looking at one single topic because my brain is always spinning 
like mm-hmm. bringing from one topic to the other and for better and or for I, worse right for <laughs> yeah when i started like reading about technology and you know sometimes books about technology sometimes magazines sometimes youtube channels and that kind of helped me a lot to rethink stuff that i'm trying to do so sometimes we're thinking about this is the right approach and we see when you see youtube videos sometimes it's telling you hey no th- this is another option you can also follow so that's what i like I-, I really enjoy that and i think that helps me a lot to address particular conversations whether it's an internal conversation with guys inside our team or maybe a customer uh, sometimes when you when you see things that are for example inside the machine i'm, I'm very picky why? Because I like things to be done right. And I'm very particular in that regard. So, and I learned that from Festo, but also from watching like machine builder videos where they are very top notch, especially in European machine builders and also North American, where they really put their hands and it's like state of art a product. And, and that's where, from what I like to watch, that's kind of the things that I like to do. Alejandro is definitely a YouTube wizard. He's the one that I usually go to and I, hey, do you have any cool videos? And then he sends me like a hundred videos and I'm like, okay, <laughs> there we go. <laughs> but yeah, yeah like okay. that's an important point. I think like, you know, the end users uh, really appreciate the, those touches, right? Like you may not always get direct recognition, but again, having worked uh, for some of those companies that would buy equipment, people do notice when, again, something like a panel is built to very tight design specifications your you know s- oh, simple yeah. things like your tie wraps are cut off with the proper tool you know what i mean it could be uh, as oh, simple yeah. as that like and that makes the world of difference <laughs> right because again if you have to put yourself in the shoes of people who will be working on that uh equipment later on and when you show up and it, it looks like a mess you have wires sticking out everywhere then it definitely doesn't give you the same impression if it's you know like well done and is inviting to uh to work on to troubleshoot whatever yeah, there's, yeah, there's, there's, there, there's an idea right there. Maybe you guys can start an Instagram for beautiful control panels or something like that, you know? Uh, like... Yeah, that's that's actually nice. <laughs> I I personally get very excited when I see picture of pictures of cabinets very well designed, you know, cabinets with all the cables properly routed, all the devices properly spaced, uh, machines that you can see like a beauty, like a Ferrari where you see like <laughs> like all the doors are completely closed, things like that. that. That's kind of the things that sometimes some customers will really appreciate, especially when you are investing in a machine that costs a fortune, right? Like 300,000, 500,000, and you expect a machine to be a really nice because you know that with the same amount of money, you can buy a beautiful house. So, and that's the way I see it. The other point that Vlad was mentioning is you expect to get a machine very nice, but also to be able to troubleshoot it in five years. So mm-hmm. every time we build systems here in, in inside Festo, we make sure that everything is right from the beginning. And in five years, if you have to troubleshoot something, you want to make sure that you everything is labeled right. Mm-hmm. Everything is properly routed. Uh, drawings are matching exactly what's supposed to, you know, to match and so on. Yeah, and you'd be surprised, I guess, those who maybe don't have uh, as much experience in the field, but depending on which uh, plant or manufacturer you go to, yeah. you may not even find any prints, right? Like if ever, right. like, yeah. and labels are a whole yeah. other story, but uh, the drawings don't match or are completely missing. So, and that's like, once again, I think it goes back to the person that com- comes into that panel, opens the door, and it's either, okay, I'm going to find this problem and everything's going to be great. Like you were saying, you know, you go to a customer site. Uh, usually in odd hours. So you're already, let's say, a little bit not looking forward to that trip. You're stressed out because you have to fix it fast. And you have either no tools available to get it done or you've got all the tools, everything looks nice and uh, you can get your job done. But yeah, like absolutely. I think it makes uh, a world of difference. Uh, People may not always, uh, like I said, appreciate it or know it if they're not working in this specific field, but it's uh, definitely a plus. I want to go back, so mm, go ahead. Yeah, one more thing is inside Festo, remember, we have Festo Didactic yep. and the Festo Didactic team uh, teach people uh, at the industry level and sometimes at the university level, all those tricks where you have to know how to route cables, how to connect, how to label and that grounding. Yeah, yeah, grounding, which is a, an import, a very important topic as well. But yes. anyways, uh, yeah, you, you had another topic, Vlad. I don't I want to make sure that we're not stuck on one. 
well, I, I, I did want to expand on that. Like, you know, like company learning, especially, uh, can you give us, I guess, a little bit more information on that? Like, uh, I still want to revisit that and talk about that. Cause I think it is important, uh, to like, well, I guess training, company, training, right? huh? Yeah. The like trainings, training. the trainings. Yeah. Within yeah. Yeah, Festo inside inside Festo we have a very unique portfolio of training. Uh, we actually have our own academy, and the academy uh, has multiple aspects. One is where you can go online, learn whatever you want. We also have uh, trainings, very like uh, let's say every two months or or whatever. And right now they are almost virtual, all of them. Uh, from Germany to the to the rest of the world, but before the COVID, we also always uh, we were always invited to go and visit in Germany. We have a huge facilities there where you can learn particular topics. So uh, the company has split every single topic separated, and then you can learn individual topics as you go, as you get more and more familiar. So you can start from a very basic knowledge about tubing, um, fittings. Uh, what kind of thread you need for a valve, what kind of flow you need in a valve, uh, what type of cables you want to use, very basic. Yeah. And then you start ramping up, up to the point that you can tune up a servo, you can configure an HMI, and so on. And all the integration, of course. Yeah. I'm you even uh, the... to hear, so, Sorry to, to interrupt. I guess I'm very surprised to hear that there's such extensive like technical training You know, internally. I have never heard of such a program um in, in in companies like it's really great that you have a team that works on that kind of content and again you know i've seen companies invest in i would say like fairly vague initiatives you know that they they train some like osha training or maybe like they pay for some like leadership training uh and what have you but i think having technical training like that is really cool uh in terms yeah of one one important thing to mention actually two oh, two points uh to mention about what alejandro just mentioned mm -hmm. is that uh, uh, don't get the wrong impression that, oh yeah, I'm going to go to this Festo training and I'm going to learn all of the Festo products. <laughs> no, these trainings that are offered by Festo Didactic are actually, they cover like, like neutral, neutral uh, brand. So it's not talking about only like, you know, these motor from Festo. No, they actually, they, their sales, the, the sales that they use for, for training are actually have different vendors all around because they want to teach the, the concepts, you know, uh, Alejandro also mentioned like flow and pressure and all of those things. They also cover physics, right? They go into electric, they go into uh, pneumatic uh, essentials and, and those kind of things. So I wanted to make sure that uh, you guys don't get the wrong impression and like, oh yeah, I'm just going to learn all of the part numbers. No, it's not like that. They, no, no, they no. have really, really good trainings over they, there. Really, they really teach you teach you in every valve, which one is the port two, which one is the port four, 12 14 i mean it goes like really to the detail yeah and and that's kind of uh interesting because we have technologies from a basic pneumatics up to hydraulics not too much but pneumatics electronics sensors and so on so it's a broad uh, uh portfolio yeah and for anyone interested there's a, a festo didactic north america so you can actually reach out to them and they have offices here in the us mm -hmm. actually also in canada so uh if if anyone is looking for you know training they can reach out to festo didactic uh north america they have a linkedin page as well so you can mm -hmm. ping them there yeah. Do they but, provide external training as well? Like, yeah, 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 there? yeah. I, I, I also wanted to make sure that. So this Festo Didactic is actually only is is their main focus is for external training. We as Festo employees, we also get the advantage of sometimes be a, being able to attend those trainings, which help us to grow our general knowledge, right? But no, these trainings are developed specifically for end users, for colleges, for universities, and so on. So their content is top notch. I can tell you because I have taken some of those courses before. Um, so yeah. No, very interesting. I think uh, I think that's good. So I am familiar with other, you know, large German European companies who have similar kind of internal training. I think it's very interesting that Festo Didactic also is offering it externally. It's uh, it's as we discussed at the very beginning, it's one of those many parts of Festo that I don't think a lot of us uh, knew existed. So I am I'm happy we talked about that. Um, and I do have one more question for each of you. But before that, Alejandra, you were saying that you were like a ping pong champion 
Um, is there some sort of international festo ping pong tournament? And if not, what do we have to do to start up some sort of international festo <laughs> ping pong tournament? Yeah, that would be nice. That would be nice. Actually, we a uh, couple, well, let's say three years ago, uh, here in, in the Toronto area uh, in our office, we actually brought a ping pong table and we put it up in the mezzanine and we did our own tournament. It was yeah. interesting because a lot of people at the beginning, they have no clue about ping pong. And you can imagine how their skills get by playing every day for an hour. And you learn from there that you don't need to spend a lot of time on a particular topics. So you can spend just one hour every day. And by the end of the year, you have 365 hours that you spend learning only one topic. So what I'm trying to say is a lot of people here in our building have no clue about playing ping pong. And when we started that tournament, people get very, like, very excited. Like they get like, no, I have to get, I have to, you know, be the competitive, champion. right? They, be, they get very competitive, which is, which is good. No, but we don't have a tournament globally. That would be nice. We can, yeah, we, we can, we can start it though. That's not reason there, there oh, was, I, there, there was, or is actually a, a soccer, a football soccer uh, tournament actually. Uh, and I know in Mexico, we used to have it, but the European countries, they do have it. So, you know, they go like Germany against, uh, you know, Belgium or something and, and Festo company. So it's, that's when it's really that's cool. Nice. That's nice. Yeah, I mean, I our say, company uh, is pretty large, so they, they have the possibility to do it. A cooler idea would be to use your robot because I, I think you have a very cool like three axis robot that could go pretty fast, yeah. right? Like paired with a vision system. Yeah, um, yeah. I think like I've seen applications, you know, where it's like a single robot that like kind of handles the ball and balances the uh, balances it using a paddle, but like an actual tournament tournament yeah. where, you know, you get to build your robot and program it. And that would be, I think, like a very interesting competition. Yeah, you actually get all the flavors there. You get vision, you get, you know, motion, you get sensors, you get wiring, you get all the technologies yep. into one single topic, which is interesting. Actually, you will be surprised how the technology is so deep involved in ping pong these days. Like they even have artificial intelligence right now uh, driving the topic because you have an, a, like a personal trainer uh, with a machine that spin the ball and, and send it over to you. And as you hit the ball, the ball travels to the other end, hits like a, like a little square. And by hitting that, the artificial intelligence system is automatically calculating all the trajectory, the time that took from the ball to go and come back. And at the same time, it scores, what's your performance? So up to that point, it's where technology is right now. So artificial intelligence is going there very quickly. Now that that's that's amazing. I, I look forward to hearing how maybe the battle of the borders, the U.S. versus Canada, in ping pong, or, or maybe we're programming we'll our robots into we'll uh, who who can program the best robot to play ping pong against uh, the other one. All right, uh, let's let's do it. Let's do it. <laughs> perfect. We'll see how. Now, I, I'm excited to hear how this goes. And, and we, we want to thank you guys. We want to be respectful of your time um, kind of as we're winding down. Uh, for everyone who's listening, who is, you know, overwhelmed with everything that you've told us, um, can you kind of can, can you kind of let them know, uh, again, kind of what your specific groups do and who should reach out to you guys for help? Yeah, definitely. So uh, just to summarize again, my name is Sandro Quintero and I support uh, the, I, I work within the electric automation division. So if you have anything, any questions regarding, you know, oh, a tooth built actuator from Festo, a vision system, uh, remote IO, servo press, many, many different things that we have out there. You can always reach out to me. You can just uh, search for my name on LinkedIn. Let's connect and let's chat there. Message. That's perfectly fine. I don't have a problem with that. Yeah, same here. So again, I'm part of the customer solutions team in North America and specifically in Toronto area. Uh, we cover Mexico, US and Canada, French and, and English. And my name, Alejandro.Lopez at Festo.com. And I can definitely um, help you and, and maybe reach out to any contact you want or any, any additional information on what we discussed today. I think we have a lot of topics to cover. Unfortunately, we were not able to cover all of them. Uh, but yeah, maybe from the next session. Really appreciate your time. And all the 
I guess all the links, all the, you know, the books will be posted in the show notes below in case you're watching or listening at a later date. But really appreciate your time. Thank you very much, Sandro and Alejandro. Um, really appreciate I just posted on my, on the chat, I just posted my, my, my email there in case Excellent. some watch this later. All right. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, guys. Perfect. Take care. Thank, thank you, you both. And thank you.